Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, on this opening Sunday of Lent, we sit amongst the purple, which symbolizes Jesus' enduring test of torture and mockery in his trial before the court and before Pilate. And during Lent, you might notice that the rejoicing and praise of the Glorias and the Alleluias have gone silent. Today, in the early days of our 40-day Lenten journey, we will hear of both testing and tempting. Testing, it's an act of verifying information, discerning truth, confirming the purity of something. While temptation, on the other hand, is an act of deception, trying to lead one astray, lead one off a chosen path and into a trap. Testing is a good thing. It's hard sometimes, especially if we don't know that it's a test. Around 8 a.m. on January 13th in 2018, the people of the Hawaiian Islands woke up to an alert that was sounding on their radios, their TVs, their cell phones, and their computers. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. In light of the reality of late 2017 brinksmanship being played out between the United States government and the North Korean government over North Korea's nuclear missile weapons and missile programs, there were a number of air raid drills, complete with sirens taking place on the island of Hawaii. And so on this early morning, as tourists in Waikiki grabbed their coffee as Surfers grabbed a wave as locals began heading to work. Receiving this alert, panic set in as the people tried to beat what they knew was a 12-minute clock before missiles would begin raining down on them. They were flocking to shelters, crowding highways, saying prayers as they contemplated their last moments of life. Unfortunately for these people, they didn't know that it was only a test. The 38 minutes of panic was caused because a technician simply selected the wrong entry on a pull-down menu at the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Fortunately, because of the swift actions of officials at many different levels, they quickly brought order to the chaos, letting everyone know that this is a test. Well, as our scene in the Old Testament reading opens today, things were finally looking up for Abraham and Sarah. Their long-promised son, Isaac, was beginning to grow strong. The confusion that they created when they tried to help God's plan out by creating a great nation through Sarah's servant, Hagar, well, that confusion had finally been smoothed over. And they were settling down in their new home in Beersheba. Now they just had to wait for Isaac to marry and have kids of his own, to have grandkids. And just like that, Abraham and Sarah's faithfulness would pay off the great nation that God had promised would finally be a reality. And then one day God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. God didn't lead off with, hey, Abraham, this is a test. It's only a test. All Abraham heard was, kill your son, the one that I promised you, as a burnt offering on a mountain that I'll show you when you get there. 
What do you suppose was running through Abraham's mind as he contemplated the reality of God's word and put that against the unthinkable outcome that would result? You don't have to have children to imagine Abraham's mindset. Even though it, at that time it was quite common for the gods of the Canaanites whom Abraham lived amongst to offer their children as sacrifices on a regular basis to ensure future, future fertility, the culturally logical, though harsh command, must have baffled Abraham. After all, God had assured Abraham before Isaac was born, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And now he wants me to sacrifice my boy. How's that going to work? But let's think about this whole thing not from our point of view. Let's think about it from God's point of view for a second. As God looks upon his servant, Abraham, he has seen Abraham's obedience. Abraham packed up his family and moved to the land of Canaan. But he did it because there was a promise attached. You will become the father of a great nation. You will have a great name, and you will receive great blessings. He trusted God eventually, and he and Sarah also finally, they received a son. To this point, Abraham had demonstrated great faith, but here's the question. Was the faith in God, or was the faith merely in his promises? Was Abraham obedient because of what he was receiving, or was he obedient because of God himself? This was a test to see what was truly number one in Abraham's life and heart. Was it Isaac, his only son? Was it the promises of future greatness and blessing that God had made? Or was it God himself? It's a good question for Abraham and for us. Do we worship God? Or do we worship his promises? James writes to us in his letter, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. My brothers and sisters in Christ, Make no mistake about it. God does test us. And he tests us to help us see where our hearts truly are. To help us see what is the motivating factor in our relationship with God. A normal life is not smooth and easy. That would be very abnormal. A normal life is like a roller coaster ride. It has ups and downs and curves and danger. Ecclesiastes notes that for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. God's word says there will be times to be born and times to die. There will be times to kill and times to heal. There will be times to weep 
and times to laugh. There will be times to mourn and times to dance, to love and to hate. There will be times of war and there will be times of peace. Our lives as Christians are filled with tests. And as we endure these tests, where are our hearts aimed? Is our relationship with God based on the benefits we receive from God? Both the temporal blessings of this life as well as the eternal blessings of life in the kingdom of heaven. Or is our relationship based on God himself? Think about it for a second. As you are tested, do you still worship God? Or are you worshiping his promises? If there were no promises, would you still worship him? God told Abraham to offer Isaac in Moriah. It was a 50-mile journey from his home, a three-day walk. Abraham didn't quibble with God. God said, do it, so Abraham did. But you know, it was a three-day walk to that place. And I can imagine over the course of those three days, Abraham had time to envision the horrific thing that was about to happen. It was three days of living in confusion over the contradiction God put before him. The beautiful promises of a son and the impossible tasks of sacrificing him. It was three days of fighting off temptations from Satan, rationalizing ways to not carry out God's command. But in the end, after three days, Abraham remained faithful to God. He said to his servants, I and the boy will go over there to worship, and we will come again to you. In those words, Abraham revealed his faith in God. Abraham believed that both he and Isaac would somehow, some way, return. After a three days journey, Abraham had no idea how God would do it, but he trusted God and his will. He believed that God would, in fact, raise his son from the dead to fulfill his promise. So Abraham bound Isaac, his only son, to the wood. Abraham raised his knife high, and God said, Abraham, Abraham, whoa, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham trusted God, worshipped him, and him alone. And God kept his promises. God raised Isaac, as good as dead, to new life, pointing the way to how he would fulfill his promise to Abraham 2,000 years later. Jesus of Nazareth, from the tribe of Isaac's grandson, Judah, the only son of God, climbed another mountain. He was bound to the wood of a cross. 
and he was sacrificed as his father looked on. Three days later, in response to his son's faithful obedience to his will, God, our Father, his Father, raised Jesus to new life on that first Easter morning. Because Jesus trusted his Father above all else, all who trust God above all else, even his promises, can rest assured that God will lead them through the many trials and tribulations that we, his children, face in this life as he brings all of us to a new creation. Abraham's story, when we really think about it, when we dig deeply into it, is a story that helps us remember God's faithfulness to his children. When we find ourselves under duress, whether we're being tempted by Satan or tested by God, let us always trust God and his will. Let us trust his way, even when it makes no sense at all to our feeble human minds. like Abraham did on many occasions. We too will falter. We will fall into sin as Satan tempts us to take the easy way out. But in those instances, remember how God continually called Abraham back to himself. Because of Jesus, God forgives us. And like Abraham, he calls us back to himself too. And then he strengthens us through his word, through his sacraments, to endure more tests and more temptations. And he helps us stand strong in the face of those. He provides us a way through the trials. He doesn't take the trials away but he does enable us to endure. And when we have stood the test, as James tells us, we will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all.